Good morning, Pastor Rob here. I hope everybody's having a good day. Had your coffee already, and today we're going to continue our study in the book of Mark. Uh, and just to save time, we're just going to go ahead and start verse by verse, Mark chapter 1, verses uh, 14 to 28. I hope we get that far. If not, we'll stop if the time uh, doesn't allow. So, Mark chapter 1, verse 14 says, After John was put in prison, Jesus went to Galilee. So we have a timeline here. John the Baptist is put in prison. He's been arrested. One thought on that is, today we hear a lot of preachers saying, if you serve God, you'll get your dreams. If you serve God, you're going to be rich. If you serve God, you'll have six private jets like I do. Just so you know, that's just not true. Name it, claim it, pray about it, you get it. Um, that's just not the case. So if John was put in prison and almost all of the disciples were martyred, then we can assume of the same situation or or you may prosper i mean god may bless your life there's nothing wrong with that um just don't make that part of your faith part of your religion that because i serve god i'm going to be rich actually the bible says and i believe it's timothy if you're serving jesus christ expect to be persecuted now that doesn't mean to the extent that they were being persecuted but certainly there's mental persecution there's you know there's, there's uh, discrimination, things like that towards Christians, and that's occurring today. I mean, the Olympics uh, opening ceremonies was really a slap in the face of Christians and, unfortunately, an attempt to overshadow what I feel were the legitimate efforts of the athletes that were competing who loved Jesus. A lot of them people were Christians, so they, they kept going. They fought and they kept going, and they didn't let that deter them. They went out and won their medals and their gold and competed like champions, so we should as well. So after John was put in prison, we have this timeline. Jesus went to Galilee. What was he doing? Preaching the gospel. And this is a key verse. Verse 15, Mark chapter 1. The time has come. This is the fullness of time. This is the time ordained before uh, time began. The time has come. He's going to preach the gospel. It's Jesus' time uh, to come on earth. And uh, in Galatians 4, 4, in the fullness of time, he came as planned before time. 1 Peter 1, 20, Acts 2, 23, 4, 28. Titus 1, 2, all of these things referred to the time that Jesus would come uh, in, in the Old Testament as well, that Jesus would come and the kingdom of God is near. The kingdom of God, uh, Jesus is presenting the kingdom of God. He is a representative of the kingdom of God. He is the kingdom of God. He's going to present every man an opportunity to inherit the kingdom of God. It's near. How near is it? Well, it's right here. There's Jesus Christ, the representative ambassador, uh, God in the flesh, the kingdom of God, and it's soon going to be coming as a real kingdom to the earth. So, uh, it, so the time has come. He is here. He has arrived as according to prophecy. The kingdom is near. Uh, the, the, the representative of the kingdom, the kingdom that's coming is, is near and repent and believe the good news. Hey, here's the good news. The kingdom is here. I'm here. I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. I'm the shepherd. I'm the gate. Uh, I'm all these things that lead you to the kingdom of God and to eternal life. So repent from what you're doing. Leave your life of idolatry. Leave your life of unbelief. Unbelief is the biggest sin that you have to overcome. If you don't overcome your sin of unbelief, and that is not believing in Jesus Christ, then you will never inherit the kingdom of heaven. So repent and believe. Turn from your wicked ways. Follow me. Believe in Jesus Christ. Believe the good news. He is the good news, the gospel. So Jesus walked along the Sea of Galilee. Love that. Very human. He's walking along the Sea of Galilee. And he saw Simon and his brother, Simon, who would eventually become Peter, and his brother Andrew, casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Now my thought here, this is a Rob thing, basically that um, you often see fishermen throwing out bait nets near the shore where they're catching the bait that they're going to put uh, out, uh, perhaps to catch other fish. Possibly, I don't know, just throwing that out there. Evidently, they were close. Maybe they were fishing. They were just close enough where they could hear Jesus talking. So Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, Sea of Galilee, the lake. It's not really that big. I think it's like 12 miles across, 8 miles wide, something like that. Not a real big uh, sea or lake, but um, it is uh, the Sea of Galilee. So they're set in, uh, throwing their net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Gives their occupation. Come, follow me, Jesus says, and I will make you fishers of men. They would relate to that. Fishers of men. Well, that's interesting. It's a, it's a, 
you know, comparison of what they're doing. They're catching fish. We're going to teach you how to catch men for the gospel of Christ. Um, at once, here's that Uthios, verse 18. Uh, Uthios, uh, immediately they left. This is what the third or fourth time we've seen that already in the book. It's 42 times in the book of Mark. So that's why they call it the Go Gospel. Uthios, at once, immediately they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little further, he saw James and John, sons of Zebedee, uh, and his uh, brother John, on a boat, preparing their nets. So they're getting ready to go fishing. Uh, Peter was the first one out there. He's ready to go, and then these guys got to play catch up and get out there with him and prepare their nets to get ready to go fishing. And then verse 20, Uthios. At once, immediately, again, here it is again, without delay, he called them and they left their uh, father, Zebedee, in a boat with the hired men and followed him. That's interesting because there was a time when the rich man said, I'll do whatever I have to do to follow you. And, God, and Jesus says, I don't even have a place to lay my head. And he says, if you want to follow me, follow me. He says, well, let me go bury my, my dad first or my uh, all those things, all these things that distract us from really following God. If your heart's not in it, you know, there can be some challenges and um, distractions. So they left their father, they left their nets, they left their boat, and they followed Jesus Christ. And that's that's true repentance. Turning from everything you're doing and following Jesus Christ. I've got a college career. I've got a career I love. I, I, I'm, oh, wait a minute, Rob, I'm getting married in a few weeks. You know what? Sometimes we just got to stop and say, Jesus, you're all that matters follow him, pray about things, look for his guidance and things. It doesn't mean that anything you're doing is wrong, but don't let anything distract you from following Jesus Christ. Make him your first priority. Yes, you have plans. I have plans, but God should always have veto rights in your life to, uh, to interrupt your life. Maybe you're going the wrong direction. He's going to save you from something that you don't see coming. He always does have our best interests at heart. It doesn't mean we'll be millionaires. It doesn't mean we'll all be on stage making golden records, but certainly we can have a more secure, safe life, a life free from sin, sometimes even free from tragedy because our decisions will lead us down the wrong path. So they leave everything. Peter, Andrew, James, and John leave everything to follow Jesus Christ. And I do wonder sometimes um, how many of us are willing to do that. When even, even as a pastor in a church, I see people clinging to their stuff you know, criticizing me and then running back to their life, not doing anything to contribute to the church whatsoever, except pick on the preacher. So anyway, that's, uh, I don't know why you brought that up. But anyway, so anyway, <clears throat> they leave their nets, they leave their boats, they leave their careers, they follow Jesus Christ. Sometimes that's required. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. And the people were amazed. So he's teaching. He's in a synagogue. What's he doing on the Sabbath and in the synagogue? All of a sudden, well, he's showing he has authority over the Sabbath. I am God in the flesh. I have authority over this Sabbath. Two, he's bringing his presence into the synagogue into the and in, then to the churches eventually. And when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. And I love this here. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority. If you're a preacher, if you're a teacher, if you're a Christian, it is okay to unapologetically teach the gospel with authority. Why? Because it's true. And this book will be around a lot longer than this earth will ever be around. This Bible and God's word will be around when we're gone. So they can try to persecute. They can try to destroy it. It will never happen. The Bible will always be. And if nothing else, as a book, it'll be in the hearts of men. Because God said, I will always put my heart my word in their hearts, my the knowledge of me in their hearts, Romans 1 and all, and in the Old Testament. So Jesus went to the synagogue. He takes authority in the synagogue. He takes authority on the Sabbath, and he takes authority over his own word. And he begins teaching them as one who had authority. And the people recognize that. People see you when you're phony as a believer. People see you when you're phony as a preacher. One of the things I, I don't like even as a preacher, and I'm not going to criticize preachers, but be careful how many stories you tell. We don't always need to hear about your kids. We don't always need to hear every joke that you've ever known. We need to hear the scriptures. We need to hear the gospel uh, in context, in truth, with the Greek, with the, with the tenses. Everything that we need to hear as believers, that makes a believer. The jokes are funny, and it makes us feel good. But the scripture is what's absolutely vital to the life of a Christian. Understanding the scripture, knowing the scripture, quoting the scripture, memorizing the scripture, and living 
the scripture. We need that. So he taught us when to have an authority. Just then, here we go again, Uthios, just then, immediately a man in the synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out. Isn't that interesting? In the very synagogue where God was supposed to be, in the very synagogue where Jesus was teaching, it's in your churches. I can tell you, as an experienced pastor, I have had people in my church, of course not my church, but the churches I worked at, they were evil. They came every Sunday, and man, all they could do was just pick people apart, and they would run people out. And I always tell that to encourage people that go to church. If you run into that person, that's his job. He is he or she can be filled with an evil spirit, never be saved, be in the church your whole life and never be saved. And the moment you walk in the door, they're the first person you meet, and they make you feel uncomfortable, or they judge you. I took a kid to a church in uh, Florida. We went to a Baptist church together, and he had an ACDC shirt. He had never been to church in his life. We were working at 84 Lumber together, going to Florida, going to school. I met him. He didn't know Jesus ever, and I was telling him about Christ. I said, go to church with me on Sunday. So we go to church, and the first person that we meet when we walk in the door is um, this person. And they look at him and go, you got an ACDC shirt on? He goes, yeah, it's my favorite band. He goes, man, God will get a hold of you and get that shirt right off your back. That kid has no capacity to hear that. Don't do that. You know what he should have said? Hey, bro, we're happy you're here. Come on in and sit down. Matter of fact, sit down next to me, and my family and I are going to take you out to eat after church is over. How about something like that? Cheers, church. That's always my mentality. Norm, we know your name. We're glad you came. That's the way it should be. Forget about what people are wearing. That kid never went to church with me again, and it was that moment that caused him not. Now, remember this. Jesus didn't do that. It was that crazy judgmental person that exists in every church and ran that kid right out the door and he never came back. So just remember that there is evil in churches. There's evil in pulpits. Be, be, um, uh, be discerning when you meet your pastor. Be discerning when you see somebody in the pulpit. If they shouldn't be there and you know it and they don't meet the biblical qualifications of pastor, walk away. Uh, find a church where there's a biblical pastor in the church. So... Um, the evil spirit cried out, what do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Now, here's another thing. I'm going to close with this in a minute. But uh, they recognized Jesus. Why? The demons were in heaven with Jesus, Revelation 12. They were there. They know what he looks like. They know who he is. They identify him. These demons cried out and knew that this was Jesus Christ. What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? They even know their day is coming when it's over. And you can read the end of Revelation for that. I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Here's another authenticating scripture that says, even the demons know. James 2.19, even the demons believe and tremble. Every altercation or every interaction with Jesus, when the demons see him, they are scared to death. They have no authority over him. And if you're in Christ Jesus, unless you allow them, they have no authority over you. You have authority in Jesus through the Holy Spirit over demonic presence. So, <clears throat> I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus sternly said, and come out of him. He commanded the evil spirit to come out. The evil spirit shook him violently and came out of him with a shriek. Again, the people see this, and they're amazed. And let me look at some of my, my notes here. We see at once here, Uthios, very often. Um, I just like this thing here. So, let's, let's just close out with this. Let's just close out with this. In the first 25 verses, we see much about Jesus Christ himself. Number one, his authenticity. Number two, the prophecies, the fulfillments. And Mark's writing is all to establish what he's seen, what he's heard, what he's been taught. And he's got a firsthand witness of the works of Jesus Christ. John the Baptist paves the way. Um, so we have all these authenticating scriptures, prophets, fulfillments, Mark himself, John the Baptist paving the way and going to prison for his preaching. People see heaven open right here uh, when, when he was, when he was uh, baptized. The heavens open. People saw that. John touched him. Uh, the people heard God's voice. So there's three senses. They see him, they hear him, and they're touching him to prove the authenticity of and the realness of Jesus Christ. He was real. He did exist. And then the demonic confession. Who are you? Son of God. Have you come to, you know, basically 
um, destroy us before our time. They love wreaking havoc on the earth, but they fear Jesus Christ. And by the way, they fear a believer too, if you have the power of the Holy Spirit. The devil tempts him, so the devil acknowledges who he is, and the demons declare and acknowledge that he's the Son of God. So look at all those things. Prophets, fulfillment, Mark, John the Baptist, people see, hear, touch him, the devil tempts him, and the demons confess that he is the Son of God. So that's the, uh, the um, teaching for today. And the only other thing I want to close out with is the kingdom of God. Jesus represents the kingdom of God. Later on, you're going to see that the kingdom of God is within you. When you become a believer and the Holy Spirit indwells your body, that is part of the kingdom of God indwelling your body. That's Luke 7, 21. The kingdom of God is within you via the Holy Spirit. And then Jesus eventually says to Peter, I confer on you a kingdom. In other words, I'm going away. I'm going to give you my kingdom. You're my representative. Uh, I have given you the Holy Spirit, which is indwelling you part of the kingdom. But I want you to tell others about the kingdom. And so that's what our job is. We inherit it by God's grace, and we're to tell others about it. So um, the kingdom of God is here, it is near, it is within you, and now it is conferred upon us to tell other people about the kingdom of God and to tell them about Jesus Christ and lead them to the kingdom of God. So um, that's the Bible study for today. That's uh, Mark chapter 1, 14 to 27, 28. And uh, maybe we'll have one tomorrow. I might take a break, but... Hope everybody's doing well, and uh, we'll continue, if not tomorrow, on, uh, on Thursday. So have a great day.